All right. So now we are going to move on to Chapter 6, um, Gauss's Law. And we will start with discussions of flux. Flux is a measure of how much of something is going through something else. Um, so you will come across the term flux in, in other contexts. In the context of this, um, of this chapter, we're going to be talking about how much of an electric field goes through a surface. And, and what we're building up towards is Gauss's law. Gauss's law is really useful because it lets you calculate the things like the electric field from a really complicated surface with much less math and using symmetry and and it's beautiful. So first we have to develop the context, the concept of electric flux. Um, so the electric flux is the amount of electric field. So um, in a given that goes through a surface, certain surface. So you're going to form a unit vector perpendicular to the, the surface and multiply by the area. Um, and in a lot of cases, you're going to be integrating over that area um, so that you get the total electric field going through the surface. So if in this case, shown on the picture here, um, the surface is not perpendicular to the electric field, so you have less electric field going through um, the surface. You have a lower flux. If you rotate the surface so that it is perpendicular to the electric field, you're going to get a greater electric, a greater flux through the through the um, through the surface. And so this shows the same thing and how you might uh, how you might start to actually calculate this. You can do some simple calculations without doing any integrals, um, where if you have um, the the one on the the situation on the left, your electric field is directly perpendicular to your surface. So we can we can draw our little n hat in this direction. Um, and you will get the flux, which is E dot N hat A, and this is a scalar because you're taking the dot product of two vectors, which results in a scalar. So this is just going to be E times A in the case on the left where A is the area of the surface, and E is whatever that electric field is there. Now, um, when you have um, when you have the case on the right, your surface is not perpendicular to the electric field. So now the surface is at an angle, um, and in fact, it's drawn so that the area is the same as the the area of the blue surface is the same as the area of the pink surface. But now, the perpendicular to the surface is is not perpendicular to the electric field. So now, E dot n hat is going to equal the electric field times cosine theta. So our flux through the second surface is A, the area of the surface times the electric field times cosine of the angle between them. So if the angle between them is less than the two, um, if it's zero, then the two surfaces, the surface is perpendicular to the electric field, and we get exactly what we had in, uh, in the first example. All right, there is an ambiguity. N hat is perpendicular to the area. But in the case of a plane, you could choose up, you could choose down. down. There's two signs that you could have. Um, so 
there is a convention that we stick with, which is that if you have a closed surface, the um, n hat is perp is pointing out of outside of the object. A closed surface is like a cylinder, um, anything that um, would form some type of closed shell. Um, so if you always want your n hat to point out if you have a closed surface. If you have an open surface, there is an ambiguity. Um, so here are some examples. In the first one, there's two possible n hats that you could have because it is an open surface. In the second one, um, anywhere you are on the surface, there is always a vector perpendicular to it. Now, note as well, as soon as you get more complicated surfaces than uh, um, anything which is more complicated than a simple plane, and you end up with um, an n hat, which depends on where you are on, relative to the object. So that math can get really ugly really, really quickly. Um, so the mostly in this class, you are not going to work with unit vectors that change as a position as a function of position. Um, or if they do, it will be a simplified case where you are integrating over the surface of a cylinder and you're using polar coordinates or you're integrating over the surface of a sphere and you're using spherical polar coordinates. Okay, so the first case, there's an ambiguity. The second case, there's an ambiguity. Or there's no ambiguity. You're always going to point towards the outside of the surface. Um, and you need to whatever you do you need so if you're integrating over an open surface you need to make sure that at the very least your unit vector is always on the same side of the surface so there is an arbitrary choice if you have an open surface you don't want your unit vector to sometimes point um, towards one direction towards the surface and sometimes the other you want to you want to choose at least a consistent set of unit vectors so that you have an unambiguous answer. Okay, so then you have you will have cases you do like this where you calculate the electric flux through a cube. So if we follow our convention, well, first of all, any the only there are only two surfaces which um which have any flux there's this surface and this surface and all of the rest of them have no flux because the the surface is the normal vector to the surface is perpendicular to the electric field so you only have to do Two, you have to only have to worry about two surfaces in this case. And our convention, our unit vector should always point outside of the object. So here, this is the unit vector. And here, this is the unit vector. Um, so when we do our flux calculation, if we want the flux through this three-dimensional object, we have to add up the fluxes through all of the objects, but we're lucky because four of the surfaces are zero. You will see this as a common theme in physics problems. There's often a lot of zeros um, because the problems that we can assign usually have to have some symmetry or simplification. If they don't, the math rapidly becomes intractable and we can't even do them. So most of the problems we actually assign simplify a lot. Okay, so now we only have to consider these two surfaces. In the upper surface, um, we have a flux of A times E because N hat, the, vec the dot product of N hat with the electric field just gives you the magnitude of the electric field. In the case of the lower surface, our E dot N hat is equal to negative magnitude of the electric field. So our flux through the lower surface is A, is negative AE. So this gives us a net flux of zero. 
And if you look at what the picture is actually showing you, so the flux is a measure of how much electric field is going through the surface. And what you see is that the, there's as much electric field coming in as going out. So it makes sense that the net flux is zero. Um, just like we had last chapter when we went through how you, um, some of the more complicated problems, if you have a more complicated surface, you are going to divide, um, you're going to write an infinitesimal patch of area, um, and then you are going to do an integral to get the flux of E, which could be a function of position, dotted with n hat d a. And the same tools that we learned in the previous um, chapter, you can use here for how you slowly build up um, your integral and figure out what you have to integrate over to get the flux. Okay, so this again, simple rectangular surface. Um, this area is A times B. The electric field is perpendicular to the surface. So the electric field dotted with the normal to the electric field just gives you the magnitude of the electric field. So the electric flux is E times A times B. Now there is still an ambiguity um, where you had to choose the direction of the unit vector, up or down. Most of us would choose positive, but um, there is that ambiguity there. And this, again, you if you have a surface, you have to consider E dot N hat, which in this case, is E cosine 30 degrees. So your flux is the area times E cosine 30 degrees. Now you can divide if you want to be clever if you're trying to calculate the electric field. So here you're given an electric field, which is a strip of this plane, which is dependent on Y. So you're gonna break it up into strips and integrate. Well, you can do it two ways. You could integrate over dx and dy, or you could just, um, you could just skip the integral over dx and set your integral up cleverly so you only have to integrate over dy. Okay, so they have already figured out an area for you. Um, if you were integrating over dx and dy, your dA would just be dx dy, and you would have to do the integral over x from zero to b. So I'm gonna set it up that way. Um, so our flux, is going to be the now double integral um, of e dot n hat d a and now I'm going to plug some numbers in here so for our e we have a constant times y squared, k hat dotted with the normal vector k hat gives me one. So I have c y squared, and then I have dx dy, and my integral over x is gonna be from zero to b, and my integral over y runs from 0 to a. So now my integral over x just gives me b. So I have b 
times the integral from 0 to a of y squared dy, which gives me b times c times a cubed over 3. So you can set the integral up the way the problem suggests, and you just simply integrate over y. You will get the same answer either way. It sort of depends on which way you're more comfortable setting up the integral. I am sometimes more comfortable setting up the entire integral than trying to come up with a clever shortcut because if your clever shortcut is wrong and you made a mistake setting it up, the whole problem's wrong. Okay, you would do something here. Now here you want to use spherical polar coordinates because spherical polar coordinates are your friend. So your unit vector is r hat. Um, so it's going to change depending on where you are on the surface of the sphere, but it's always going to be perpendicular to the electric field. So then if you want to do your integral, we'll set this up as our triple integral over the surface and E, or sorry, no, double integral because it's over a surface. So E dot DA in this case is e r hat dot r hat and then a small air section of the surface of a sphere is going to be um, r squared sine phi well, let's see depends on it's sine phi d phi d theta and the integral of phi is 0 to pi and the integral over theta is 0 to 2 pi. Note that math and physics books switch the definitions of phi and theta. So if you are looking up an equation to um, have some sort of shortcut for setting up a spherical polar uh, integral, make sure that you're always using a self-consistent um, definition. Um, okay, and then it is left as an exercise to the reader that the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi. So this would give you 4 pi times the uh, electric field. The, by the way, an exercise for the reader or left as an exercise for the student is usually code for the math is a little ugly and hairy. You can do it, sort it out yourself. Sometimes the graduate E&M textbook is notorious for it is an exercise left to the reader to show that blah, 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 and that this, is a, this has applications. That just sometimes is an entire field um, on its own. Um, so when you hear exercise left for the reader, that is perilous. It usually means a lot of hard, stupid, ugly work. Okay, so then the flux through uh, sphere. So your um, the electric flux through a sphere um, is going to be the same depending on the, um, is going to be same, the same independent of the radius because your electric field um, drops off with 1 over r squared um, and the surface, uh, yes, four, then the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So if you calculate, and I think I made a stupid mistake on my previous slide, you calculate the surface, so the electric field times the area of the sphere, which is at any given point of, on a shell, it is um, from whatever charge you have, if you have a point charge, kq over r squared times 4 pi r squared. So it is kq times 4 pi. So the flux is independent of the radius of the sphere. 
and that sort of makes sense. The electric, the flux is a measure of how much field is going through the surface, but because the same shell includes, encloses the same charge, it's independent of the, um, of the radius of the sphere. Okay, and then you can understand the flux in terms of the field lines. So field lines, if you draw them properly, should be um, separated different distances depending on how strong it is. And um, so if you have an electric flux, which is zero, you have the same number of field lines coming into the surface as you have going out. If you have electric field lines pointing out from the surface, like what you have if you have a point charge, then you have net field lines going out and you don't have anything going in. 